I've talked for just a couple of minutes, if I can manage that, just a couple of minutes, which is always gonna be a lie, about how things are done and how things are done properly. There are a lot of different ways to skin a cat, as I like to say. Finding your technique or your way of doing things, if it works for you, is the whole ultimate goal of building a shower or doing a bathroom renovation or for that matter, anything on your house, period. But specifically, showers kind of trip people out, DIYers, homeowners, stuff like that, because they're afraid of water. And rightfully so, they should be afraid of water because it can cause a lot of damage. There's a lot of YouTubers and a lot of people out there and organizations and things like that who try and make um, kind of monolithic. Everybody has to do things the exact same way. Everybody has to do things by these standards. And I don't have a problem with standards, believe it or not. Standards are, are uh, how could I best put this, are, a dummy's way out. Not that you're a dummy, but standards are put there in a, at a high level so that anybody could do it and kind of end up with the same result. But if you're learned and you're intelligent and you can think of it like water does and you can figure out things for yourself and everything, there's really no rules. That's the truth, the God's honest truth. There are people that will fool you into believing that there's only one way or maybe two ways of doing things because it's based on a technique or based on some type of organization that tells you so. Or like I said, as I referenced, some YouTubers will tell you, you're gonna have a failure if you don't do it my way. And that's not true. The truth is, you can't handle the truth. That if you do it correctly, and if you just think through some of these 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 ways, I have changed my ways over the years. There was a time, probably three years, four years ago, I want to think three years or four years ago, where I had my wall board sitting on top of my pan material. Never in my wildest dreams would I ever think about putting my wall board in my pan, no matter what the makeup of the board is, unless it's foam, which I don't do foam wall board. But unless it's foam, never, ever, ever do this. This is asking for trouble. Again, some YouTubers will tell you when this board happens to be a cement product that it won't wick up water, and that's a lie. The truth is it'll always wick up water and it will cause damage, maybe innocuous damage from behind, but I have pulled out wall boards of every possible makeup and it's gonna cause damage. Nowadays, I don't do that. I leave a little gap. Nobody told me and there's nothing ever written about my particular way of doing things. My way of doing it now is I'm thinking like water. Well, water could still get up here if I'm setting my wall board on top of here, despite the fact that I'm red guarding my wall and my floor going down. So three or four years ago, I decided, you know what? A better way to do this is to leave that gap three quarter to about an inch gap. And you can see on my other videos how I do that. But that gap serves as a stop gap, literally, from water ever penetrating outside of your shower. I don't care where in your shower water can get outside, even your curb material, this is where the gap's at. Right at your curb too. Not just your walls, but your curb. Your tile slides up under that, and you still have a little gap between your tile and the bottom of the wall board. You red guard the whole thing, and you're good to go. That's the proper way to do things, in my opinion. Even though I didn't write it down in some book somewhere, if you see any of my videos, the way I explained it just now, you're gonna understand. That's the way that I think about water. How can water evacuate your shower other than opening your door? How can water penetrate into any of the material you put in there? And that's my way of doing things. Think for yourself. Think how can water possibly get outside of my shower? That's all you have to do. It's a very easy process. There are different ways, as I said, to skin a cat. On the following video, what you're gonna see is a couple ways that I've devised myself using a product that I don't necessarily like, but it fit the purpose for what I was using it for. And I don't know that I'll ever do it again that way, but on this particular job, I use that product. Even though I don't like it, I used it because I trust it and other people trust it, so I used it. It's unconventional and again, one of those things that's not written in a book. No, you're not supposed to do it this way, but it doesn't matter. You see, the end result is still the same. Now, did I do some overkill in this video? In addition to using this product, yes, I probably did. But again, I have, I have a customer base that I have to answer to. I don't want a failure. So I'm kind of ensuring that there's a little bit of redundancy involved. And that's, and that's, <coughs> oh, sorry about that. So there's no one way to skin a cat. There's all different types of methods to make sure that your way is the right way. The right way is that it works. And even if you have to hoof it, even if you have to do it different way than what the book tells you, It'll work, do it. So I find myself doing another curbless shower. I've been doing quite a few of these lately. 
And this one is going to be a little different because I'm, I'm approaching it in a whole different manner than I normally would. This is a slab um, foundation that's on here. So it's not a second or a third floor, which makes life always a little more difficult. For all intents and purposes, this is builder's grade tile. Yes, it looks nice. Yes, the symmetry in the corners is nice and all that stuff, but it's not what I call a spec house. You know, the people didn't come in and say, this is the tile that I want. This is basically what, what was given to them on the day they bought the house. So, as opposed to builder's grade tile back in the 90s and the 2000s, early 2000s, or even prior to that, um, used to be 4x4. Four four. And nobody wants the 4x4 four four ceramic tile anymore. So, builders have stepped up their game a wee bit, but um, this is, even though it's a, it's, it's a ceramic, it's a low-end ceramic, uh, you could say that it's porcelain, um, and you probably um, don't know the difference, but I can't get the edge off here. But on the edge of this tile, it's usually brown. Oh, there it is. Yep, it's brown. So it's what I call glazed clay, and this is probably the lowest end tile that you could get. Typically, it's $1.50 a square foot or less. More often than not, it's about 80 to 90 cents a square foot. And people are like, oh, that's a great deal. But look what happens when it chips. So you end up with this brown spot. Whereas porcelain is kind of the same color through and through. And even if it's not, you're not gonna, it's not going to be a very, very distinguishable uh, chip that's going on. So, uh, there's really nothing I can say about this. There was no damage. There's nothing going on here um, that I know about, anyway. When I do the tear out is usually when I find any damages, if any. I'm not going to find any floor damage because, again, it's a concrete slab. I'm not going to find... There's a lot of stuff I probably won't find, but if I do, I'll show it to you. Um, this is going to be an ADA uh, shower. Um, so kind of a disability type of uh, shower to where a wheelchair can get in here. Typically wheelchairs are no more distance than a couple of these tile. So, you know, if you're looking at about 24 inches, um, that's what I'm looking at getting out of this shower. Actually a little bit better than that, probably about 30, about 30 inches or so. This last 12 inches of, that you see here will be a bench. So, I want to take it out to the end of this wall, but they don't want to do that. So. I'm relegated, I, I talked them into at least bringing it out this little six, seven, eight inches here, um, which will actually still get them one, two, three, four, five, about an extra five square feet out of their shower because, and then of course, whatever the curb makeup is too. So it's gonna be a larger shower than what you see here in the end. And because it's gonna be a curbless shower specifically, um, it, it will definitely appear larger, even though I can't get that last eight inches or so tear out all this concrete. Typically a slab is going to be six, eight inches and all that concrete has to go down to the dirt and then I have to re-pour all that concrete to to do a, an intentional pitch down to the drain area. So that that prep work alone is going to take you know a day, day and a half just to do that and it's, a, it's very labor intensive so I usually try and not do it if I if I don't have to and in this case we came up with a plan. Uh, when you come into this bathroom uh, we're pretty flush with the carpet, but I already know that the tile is about three-eighths of an inch thick based on having to look over there, and I already know that the thin set is going to be about another, and eh, more or less about a quarter inch, maybe a little less than that. So I already have a rise going on to begin with, a little bit, whereas I don't over here because that fake shower pan is butted up right against the tile. And again, the bench is going to go out to about, well, about the thickness of the tile. So all I'm doing is this area here. The drain is going to get moved if I can to get it center. Um, and then at that point I can I can kind of slope my my uh, mortar down to this edge and this edge and that edge and that edge um, with enough girth of my mortar to make it happen to where I have a nice pitch. Um, anyway this knee wall is going to stay where it's at. It's going to, as I said, it's going to get bumped out a little ways um, there's going to be eventually a panel of glass on this knee wall that will kind of, be, there'll be another panel here that will be cut over the knee wall. There will be no uh, sill top like you have here and it'll come, that second panel will come straight down, will be cut by the glass company, straight down to the bench, wrap around the bench and then just stop at the end of the bench. 
and there will be no door because it's deep enough that there doesn't need to be a door and they don't want one and that way they can facilitate getting the uh, wheelchair in, in and out easily. Um, I build my benches outside of the shower so once I get all this material taken off I will start the process of building the bench proper then I'll know where my drain sets um, and once that bench is, and the reason I do that is because if there's ever a problem with the pan you don't have to take out whole, the whole bench and pan. If there's ever a problem with the bench you don't have to take out the pan. So if you tie them together then you're stuck taking out everything and making more work for yourself. Um, this tile will eventually, this is 24, this is porcelain, 24 by 12 porcelain that will be elongated on this entire floor, probably staggered by thirds on the floor, staggered in half on the two walls, um, going around. I think there's going to be a niche on the back, and so that niche will be a typical 28, 30 inch niche um, with this tile, this hectagon type of tile, which is pretty thick going on the back of the niche. That will also be the floor. Because I'm cutting through the grout line uh, to get rid of these tiles, I still have to be able to cut this tile this way. But let's say, for example, I was coming out to here in the middle of a tile or a third of a tile or something like that, and I had to get rid of all this tile going that way, but I wanted to preserve the floor tile. This is a handheld tile saw. It is basically a diamond type coated blade, same as you would have on any other wet saw. Um, it used to have, when I bought it years ago, it used to have a pump. Um, not a pump, but a little hose that fed again to the side of it. You can put some water in there. I can spray water directly on the blade as I'm cutting. Typically I don't, but I will put a shop vac right there as I'm cutting and have somebody hold the end of the shop vac because this kicks up a lot of dust. But you can get a really clean cut going all the way on the tile. I've used it quite a bit in that fashion. So just a little trick if you ever want to cut your tile on a floor and um, want to figure out the best way, get one of these. This is, um, this is the best way I've ever figured out. So I ran into an issue. This is interesting. I always enjoy doing the tear out to see how things were built. Uh, so yeah, ran into an issue here. Uh, typically what happens on shower pans, these fake shower pans, fiberglass shower pans, is they crack and or uh, they get so dirty you can't clean them anymore and those are two of the major reasons why um, I'm called to take them out even a small thin crack will beget leakage um, and so in the end uh, what I find is that some of those pans don't have the grid system set up on them to where they sit on the floor flat and nice and even you know the grid should be very thin and they don't have those and that's usually why they crack the correct way to do them is actually embed them into mortar and the correct way they did this was they embedded it in mortar. In fact, they even had plastic sheathing that was on top of this mortar. When I did the tear out, I took all the plastic off of it. So they actually set the plastic on there specifically so it'll dry and cure properly. And then set everything and you can see the grid. And the grid system on the bottom of the shower pan was very good. I mean, look at all those squares. So they didn't really need to do this, but it was good that they did because this pan would have never cracked. But the issue now is... I have all this mortar sitting on the subfloor, and I can tell that my subfloor, well, I really can't tell, but it seems to be about four inches thick. And I'm not going to get that much of a rise that I thought I would by just building up this floor here. Sometimes things kind of tell you how they're going to work as you go along, but inevitably that drain is going to have to kind of jet out to this area here, so I'm going to definitely have to go into some type of concrete. So my original plan went to hell in a handbasket pretty quick. Where I was going to put tile on top of here, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm actually going to put a primer on all of this tile and set tile straight on top of it because it turns out they don't want that big step up going on, which I don't want either. So that relegated me to knocking out this layer of concrete. I'm about probably three quarters to an inch down. Um, so what I did is I basically just cut a square with a circular saw. The bench is going to go here, so I backed off of where the bench is going to go. Um, and then I have this great Bauer uh, jackhammer, which helped me immensely getting all this first layer of concrete down. Um, my worst na nightmare was that this is about 8 inches thick of concrete. That turned out basically to be the case. Uh, Anyway, it's not the point of this video. 
I just thought I'd give you an update on all this stuff because eventually I'm going to screed down um, the, my mortar and everything down to where I have the slope. But this drain has to be center. And I guess the reason for me coming online and doing a video, a lot of people, when I do a concrete, and I have very few concrete slab type of drains, but when I have to bust into the concrete, people always ask on the comment section, where is the P-trap? So this is an excellent opportunity because I rarely, if ever, go all the way down to the P-trap P -trap because I already know it's usually about 8 to 10 inches below grade. So here's the conundrum I'm in. I'm, I'm digging out this hole over here. I'm trying to find a bite to where, you know, I can actually put um, a 90 on and then bring another 90 up because I already know there's a P-trap, so I don't need to put a secondary one in. That would be dumb. But um, the 290s would get me out to this area where I need to be. And I keep digging down and digging down. And I'm not fi And then I finally found a bite here. But by the time I found a bite here, I'm also uncovering the rest of this drain. So this drain is going out to the street. To answer the question, where is the P-trap? And as I said, usually 8 to 10 inches. So the P-trap starts right at 10 inches. And it probably goes down about 14. Um, but in case you were wondering, and if you're ever going to do a job like this, your P-trap is... Usually about, this is a little deeper than some, but they're all going to be uh, 8 to 10 inches down below grade. So, uh, the conundrum I have now is is twofold. It's yay, and it's also boo, because I was going to deal with that and move it over here, which wouldn't be too far. Um, but I can't, and I couldn't get a bite over there. So what, I, and, and this is the yay part, is that I can actually cut off right here. And I have a new P-trap, which I happen to have in my truck. And I'm exactly where I want to be for center. That's exactly where I want to be. In fact, it's probably closer to here. So I'm going to go ahead and glue that in. I'm going to fill the rest of this with dirt. And by the way, when you do a tub-to-shower conversion or something like that, um, when you get into a concrete slab, your your little box area uh, with your drain, that go that where your drain goes below slab, you'll have a box area. And you'll you'll feel dirt right away. When you do a conversion, you're going to fill in that area at the top of your concrete. You're going to fill that in also with concrete. But in this case, you would not do that. You need to be able to access, as this, these people uh, gave me access by virtue of all this dirt. So no, you're not going to fill all that in. You're, you're going to put some shale, some rock type material down there uh, to kind of shore it up, or you're just going to backfill all the dirt that you took out of there up to the point where the concrete's at, which is about here, about seven inches or so, seven, eight inches. Um, and then at that point, once you have your dirt firmly packed down, that's when you would backfill this whole area with your uh, bags of concrete that you have, or you should have on hand. All right, so this is the final result of putting the new P-trap in. As you saw, it used to be over there. I cut it off. Um, I marked clearly exactly where my glue lines were, based on exactly where I wanted it. Um, I brought it up, I think it's about 12 and a half inches from that connector. It's a little higher than I want it, but I also leveled it off with my new drain. Put a level on that, make sure that both directions is level, um, and that's all it's there for. Uh, the next step is just pouring back in all the dirt. Don't encapsulate with this with concrete, um, never ever with a P-trap. So I'm just going to put the dirt in, fill that up, tamp it down the best I can, make sure that's still level and all that stuff, and then I'll just pour in my concrete. This is the next day. I have the bench built, and uh, the drain is set, and the drain is level. And everything's filled in with the concrete. Uh, so I'm still with my uh, inch, inch and a quarter um, cut out over there, that same over here. A little deeper in some areas and definitely a little deeper over there um, but I'm already aware whoops, that down to my drain my bubble is definitively off which is great in all directions than I need it to be so that's exactly where I want it and I have enough girth enough room up under there to put my uh, sand topping mix and that's what I'm going to do next so I have my sand mix I have another bag just in case and I'm going to screed that all the way around here until I get a nice slope going down to the bottom of my drain you see this concrete bonding adhesive anytime I bond any type of cement material to another cement material 
then I always use this. Um, I have a little throwaway brush, which I will throw away. Um, and this dries pretty quick, so I'm just going to kind of slather that in there so that everything adheres very, very well. So this is almost screeded out to where I want it um, and all sloped down. There's a little bit, maybe an eighth of an inch drop off over there. And I left that specifically because I've got a surprise coming, which you'll see, and you will be surprised. All right, it is the next day. I uh, screeded out my sand topping mix. So what I want to do is make this completely waterproof, but I don't want to use um, Redguard as a waterproof. I don't want to use Redguard as a shower pan. I know I can. I know if I paint four or five coats on here, I'm good to go. But I decided not to do that. So what I did, and I interrupted myself. Sorry, me. So what I did to create that slope uh, a couple months ago, and I even posted a video about it. Where's this piece at? There is a quick setting mortar out there, and um, it, it dries very, very fa fast. Um, I used it kind of runny, a little bit runny, and then I kind of screeded it out. You can tell where it's drying at. And I kind of married the shower pan mortar along with this quick drying stuff. And now it's very flush and very even with the top side of this, which is wonderful. It's just It just makes the transition so, so, so smooth. Um, and still, can't see the bubble. There it is. So, you see I have about, I don't know, probably about half an inch pitch going down there. Pretty profound, pretty quick. That's what I want. It's kind of a short shower. And same thing over here. And I love it. I love that I was able to just kind of devise my own method. I have went out, <laughs> you'll never believe this. I have went out and I bought Schluter. Now, the reason I bought this is because I know that it's 100% waterproof, that it's very thin, that, you know, I don't have to wait for, as I said, three or four coats of Red Guard. And this is probably the only time in my life, I'm not going to say that for sure, but as far as I know, this is the only time that I'm ever going to use this stuff. In fact, this is the first time. And I know this is not the proper application, but it doesn't matter because I know it's waterproof. Um, so I'm going to use it as a pan liner. And I've already pre-cut it so that it goes right flush with the tile here. And then it goes all the way up my blocking and all the way up in the back. I think past my blocking and then over here I got another piece cut and I'm going to overlap probably about three or four inches. So I have more than enough for my second piece to kind of go up this blocking. And I'm going to screed out some thin set on this entire pan area. And I'm going to put thin set also on the boards. And I'm going to rub that off with a blade. And um, yeah, just do it as if I were doing it on a normal application. I'm going to also put my uh, locking, locking flange as I would with a normal liner. I'm going to do the little X I cut in a normal liner with that schluter um, and put my locking flange in there and do my little X's around the bolts and put my locking flange on there. Um, and of course the caulking around there too. And then on top of that, what I'll probably do where the seam is at, I'll also red guard that. In the corners I'm going to do my normal, I'm not going to use their fleece type of stuff, I'm going to use my normal uh, hospital fold in those two corners. Um, and then just let it rest up against the top of the blocking. My uh, wallboard will overlap that 100% uh, waterproof shower pan. This has been a five day prep just to do the shower pan area. Well, the bench too, but yeah. This is the next day. Um, I also red guarded uh, the surface of this. Um, I don't know that it's really necessary to do that. You know, I trust the product even though I don't like the product. Um, it had a use for this particular application to make sure that it, it basically just worked uh, as it were a pan liner um, the same way I did. Um, but again, what I said before is not trusting this product. 
very much where the seams are and that's the reason I'm red guarding it. Um, it doesn't make any sense to just do the seams. I've got all kinds of red guard on hand um, and it wouldn't matter if it's Aka Defense or uh, Latacrete. I mean anything will work. I just, I just want to be sure that there's no water penetration. And this is day five. I think it's five or six. Uh, sorry I didn't show all the process, but um, the Schluter went up the wall, as I normally do with the pan liner, probably about six, seven inches, all the way up and around. I did a little fold like I normally do, but I put thin set in there to hold it in. I didn't put any screws in it. Not that it would matter a whole lot, but um, yeah, it's a curbless shower now. I always build my bench out of um, uh, backer board and grain board on the rest, and all of this will get sanded and remudded if there's any discrepancy tomorrow and then the whole thing will get red guarded twice this will actually be yeah i'll do that twice i was going to do it three times not really necessary so i am into the next day and everything is uh prepped and ready to go the layout's working out pretty good here as far as the math goes i'm going to have to inevitably take off let me see, about half an inch. So I'll just cut off half an inch on one side or the other and everything else will kind of follow in. So yeah, uh, ready to go on that. I like this idea of using, uh, don't know if I'll do it again, I'm very tempted to, rather than using a pan liner, um, a thick mill pan liner, this is a much better idea because I can screed all the thin set on, uh, push it down there, and yeah, I'm not going to tile the same day the way they recommend. Definitely let that dry and definitely do the seams and around the drain as I did with Red Guard to be sure that it's 100% waterproof. I've got about three or four days of tiling to do very intricate type of stuff going on here. So I'm going to get to it and uh, I will see you on the next one. Things are such a mess. When I do tile. But eventually it's all going to look great and it will be done and a memory. And it is finished. Hey, if you enjoyed that video and you learned something, consider being a Patreon member. Five, ten, fifteen dollars a month would help me greatly produce more videos. I make nothing up from YouTube at all. If you're going to call me for advice, please donate fifty dollars for thirty minutes. My link to my PayPal and my Patreon account is down below. You can click on those. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so you get immediate notifications as soon as I post videos. And thank you very much for your support.